my family today. Um, everyone who um, is a low uh, from the um, east southern part of China, uh, we come exclusively from three villages. Um, I shouldn't say exclusively yet, and I'm absolutely sure. Uh, we come from uh, Lo Shui Hap, which is my own village, a very large village, historic, um, over 200 years old, and preceding that, uh, our village in Meijian, further north. And we also come from Yukampu, a village which we share with the Chins, and we come from Detfu, which is a quite a small village. If you come from these three villages, you're almost likely to have a, a blood relationship with me. <laughs> when I went to China and visited with an old uncle who was quite, um, as we might say in, <laughs> in Western culture, distantly related to us. But no such thing as distant relationship among Chinese. <laughs> so I went to visit him and sh showed him a portrait of the family. And um, very old, taken in China itself in 1925. And he was able to identify everyone in the, this, this portrait of the family. And then he invited me to a magnificent banquet, and he said, um, well, now tell me about your, your sisters. I said, well, um, now what do you mean, my sisters? You, in the back of my head, he, how did he know I had sisters? And um, he, I said, well, um, what, 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 what are you... What do you mean, my sisters? Do you, do you know them? Do you, do you know who their mothers are and so on? He said, uh, I said, then he began to say, to call the names like Lupi, Daisy, Na, and I was so struck uh, by his memory. And, and I said, well, how do you know these names? He said, how could I forget when your father sent money back to the village to help us to survive? So that's, to me, the, the story of names, which meant a lot to me. Where I lived was right in front of the Chinese Benevolent Association, which was the association that all the Chinese put together to buy. And it's a place where, um, it, you know, they would have meetings, you know, for the community. And, um, and in the early years, that's where the Chinese would come to have, to trash out any problems they had, with any kind of problems with the government or whatever, or they'd come together on Chinese New Year. Um, so it was like um, the place where everybody would come to. And I, so I lived right in front of it, you know. And on the third floor was, there was a Guanggong. Guanggong was uh, uh, like a god. And um, people would come there and like, worship it, or on Chinese New Year they would go and um, give an offering, offering and also do their, their um, try to find out their future. I don't know if you've known, you've heard of I Ching. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I Ching, where you <clears throat> um, find out what is your, you know, the use the yarrow sticks and find out which ones. And then from it, you <coughs> tell a story, and then from the story, they kind of say that that's what's going to happen to you. So they tell the future. But I lived right in front of there, and as a matter of fact, in um, every Chinese New Year, 
there would be the Chinese firing off the firecrackers, which would be like lighting the firecrackers, which would burn for about uh, 15 minutes, you know, bah, 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 really um, something, because every other merchant would do the same thing. So the Chinatown was like a, you know, like a war zone. <laughs> Because everyone was firing their clappers to see, well, to drive away the the, the, um, the spirits, the evil spirits, right? <laughs> so we I also had to do it too. We had to buy this uh, long firecracker and string it up and then light it and then blah, 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 you know. <laughs> and then after half an hour, the whole Chinatown would have that smell of sulfur. You know, and then the new year would come in, and then you'd hear mahjong in the distance, you know. And because right in Chinatown there, where I live, a lot of them would play mahjong upstairs. And that is when they would play mahjong, you know, because that's when you, they think they would win. So you'd hear the mahjong tiled, you know, in the background. And that's the only time my father played mahjong at Chinese New Year. And um, I think maybe he thought he would win at that time, you know. But that's the only time he played <laughs> Chinese New Year. And um, yeah, so my experience in growing up in Chinatown there, or in my family, is very Chinese. Not like some other Jamaican Chinese, because they would be more uh, exposed to a different uh, environment. And what does being Chinese Jamaican mean to you personally? As a matter of fact, it, it doesn't really mean anything, it's just only my color, so to speak. Um, being, a, being a Jamaican is uh, just being a Jamaican. Jamaican really doesn't really imply that you're in color, as a matter of fact. Uh, being Jamaican is a Jamaican. As, as I said, if you come to uh, our social gathering, there's a lot of Jamaican of different colors, but we're all Jamaican, and that's it. I mean, point blank, there's no... Um, Oh, you're Chinese Jamaican, yeah. so it make a big difference. Or you're black Jamaican, so it make a big difference. Or a white Jamaican. We have all different colors, and we're all Jamaican. And so we don't look at each other for color. Oh, I prefer your color, you prefer my color. And this is why in Jamaica there's a lot of integration. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you'll see <laughs> when you come to this part of the world, you see people of different color. But they're all mixed, so what's the big deal? You know, as a matter of fact, my wife is mixed. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what am I going to say? And my grandchildren are all mixed. What am I going to say? <laughs> oh, you know, those, we're all a human being, yeah. regardless of what they are. We all, you know, should respect each other. The only thing that bothers me is there's so much problem all over the world today. These migrants are having such a hard time from the States, from, I mean, from um, Honduras and from the Middle East and... Well, I shake my head sometimes. But, you know, at this point in time in our life, in the, in the 20, 20th, 21st century, things should have been much better. But for some reason, there's too much turmoil in each, uh, in each country. You know, so I, it's hard for me to say what should be and what shouldn't be, but they are the ones that make the, the country run, so to speak. So, yeah. As soon as you could see over the counter, you were uh, you were obliged to come in and um, help whichever way you can. Uh, and when we were very young, we started out uh, just like watchmen. So we are to uh, make sure that nothing is stolen and, of course, raise an alarm. And after that, you started selling small items. 
And then later on, when your mental arithmetic was great, you would uh, serve more than more items and collect money and give change as well. Uh, for the um, hardware business, um, my, my brother, when we got older, he was in charge of that. And the dry goods department, of course, um, fell on my shoulders. For the gasoline station, um, this was um, a very good thing that happened uh, in our district because the uh, local folks had to go so far to get gasoline. And um, for the cinema, it was just by chance that we had, uh, my father had a friend who, um, who knew about renting movies from the city of Kingston and have it uh, shipped down by train to a nearby railway station where we would, we would pick it up and then um, show the movies to the delight of the neighborhood and also to us children as well. Needless to say, um, we helped, uh, we helped uh, the, the local folks to build the cinema, which is just a plain concrete um, half open air building. And one wall was painted white to be the screen. My brother was in the, in the upper area with the projector, 16 millimeter projector, and he would screen the movie. Myself, I would be in the box office in the lower level uh, selling tickets, and another brother would be at the door collecting tickets. There was another door um, lower, uh, in the lower area. I guess you could call those the cheap seats. And um, this is how the family operated. So the, we, it was something like uh, one shilling, one English sterling shilling, for the, um, I guess, first 10 rows in front, and behind it was two shillings. And if you thought you would like to go upscale, you would go up to the upper level near the projection room and pay two and six pence. <laughs> These movies provided a lot of entertainment for the neighborhood. Oh, of course, my brothers loved all the cowboy movies and uh, John Wayne and Tarzan in those days. And myself, I love the musicals. And, um, and up to this day, I sing Doris Day, K. Sera, Sera, which was in the Alfred Hitch Hitchcock movies. And um, I remember, um, I remember uh, going, to, um, going to see Love is, is a Many Splendid Thing, which was shot in uh, Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood, but um, supposed to be in Hong Kong. So, um, and also um, Nancy Kwan, uh, uh, The World of Susie Wong, which created a lasting Im impression on me because I really wanted to um, see Hong Kong and see that setting. So um, that sort of opened my eyes as well as, as being entertained. After a while, um, the government changed. And when we were growing up, it was a labor government. So that's basically favoring financial, everybody out to make a few bucks and live, right? After that, the People's National Party got in. That's Michael Manley, the man that was a good-looking guy. <laughs> and his idea was everybody got cheer, <laughs> even all, the, all different races. You're not going to have any special thing. Everybody had to cheer. And then we had some people, like one of my directors, Chinese guy who came to Canada. He kept saying to me, we got to leave, you know. So I said, why? Because, I mean, I'm happy there, you know. He said, because we're going to go communist. This was the, the, the fear that Jamaica would go communist with Michael Mandy and him wanting everybody to be equal, right? Huh?
So, you know, once you talk about communism, the Chinese are going. They don't want to see this. So family started moving away. And then, next thing I hear, Johnny was one of the ones that everybody have to go, you know? Like the mooses, if one decides to do something, everybody has to do it. Eh? So next thing you know, we're all going to the Canadian High Commission. <laughs> and I'm saying, why the hell Canada? I all go to Canada. A place that's cold and far and we all came to Canada. And guess what? It was really worth it. Jamaica was paradise, mm -hmm. you know, I mean in in a sense when you're you know, you can't beat the fact that you can go to the beach every Sunday. That's what we did. I mean, it was like, yes, we work. But, you know, in those countries, you don't you don't work. You work certain hours and you're able to survive. And, you know, financially, you did okay, you know. And, um, but you lived a good life. It was a good life. And when I was leaving there, I actually, um, I was sad to leave because, you know, I, I, when I left there, as I said, I was 25, you know, but... I cried, you know, on the plane because, you know, it's just, well, you don't know what you're coming to, you know. I mean, in a way, you know what you're, you're leaving, but, um, but you only remember the good things while you're leaving. But there were things that, um, and I think, I think all in all coming, though, when you look back, um, I think it was, well, it was the best thing that we all did, all my family, for their children because their children eventually was able to go to university, did well, you know, did very well here. But it was rough initially, even I can remember my brother coming before his wife, that was Jerry, the third boy in the family. And he almost came home back because he came to try and see if he could get a job. Mm -hmm. Um and he was up here for maybe three, four months, and he could not find any work. So he said, you know what, I think I'm just going to come back home. But it's a good thing he didn't, because as you said, he came, settled in, found a job. Um, the, the Canada was, um, you know, the right thing for most of the Jamaican Chinese, I think, who left there. And, um, and you know, it's funny today, I would just add that, um, those friends that I actually went to school with, right, moved to Canada too. And today we go to this Chungjing club, and they're there. After all these years, we have met back, and we um, have functions there now. Um, I left when I was uh, 11. We immigrated to Canada, um, uh, to Etobicoke, where I lived with my cousins for the first couple years uh, in grade 8. Uh, because Jamaica is under the British system, it's actually a couple years... Um, uh, under the British system, it's actually a couple years, um, I guess, uh, ahead or more advanced than the typical system. So I was 11 years old. But um, I went straight to grade 8, although technically I would have been in grade 6. Um, so the kids were a lot bigger. And I remember the first class was hockey, or it was gym, and it was hockey. And I remember, um, because I couldn't skate, they would put me in goal and shoot pucks at me. And to this day, I still don't watch hockey. I hate that bloody game. So uh, <laughs> that's one thing I'm not very Canadian about. It was, it was really fabulous. It was an interesting time in the 70s because Canada was really opening up and um, it, it um, was accepting under sort of, you know, the Trudeau government of multiculturalism and, and this whole, you know, uh, new wave of immigration, which really transformed uh, the city. Um, except we didn't know we were transforming the city. We were just like, wow, this is cool. Where am I? You have more, you know, I mean, it went from one channel 
uh, a one-channel universe, Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, to a multi-channel universe in, in Canada. And, and for me, and now I'm, I'm now the television critic at the Star, that was an amazing thing. Of course, I promptly stopped reading books and just watch TV brainlessly for the rest of my life. <laughs> but, you know, it, that, that, that was my uh, experience. Um, I, I must say it wasn't major culture shock. Um, you know, Jamaica was, um, well, the school I went to in Jamaica was very multicultural anyway, and it was, it was, it was, um, it was British, um, and the students were, were multicultural. So, uh, from all walks of life. And of course, the, the, the J J Jamaican motto is out of many one people. So there were many, many, uh, it, w it was already a very diverse, I felt, at least within the school, uh, a fairly diverse community. So when I came to Canada, it wasn't um, major culture shock. I was super excited. I was sad to leave my friends. But when you're 11 years old, it was like, holy macaroni, you know, you've got more than one channel on television. That is like, oh my God, that's bonkers. And, uh, you know, the selection you of, of, you know, ice cream you can get in the supermarket. I mean, when you're 11 years old, that's all you can think about. Um, really, it's not the fact that your mom is 2,000 miles away and, and you're living with your relatives. Everyone loves a Jamaican girl. Jamaican, a fusion of Jamaican and Asian Chinese you see, which is pretty sweet because you get some spicy roti, patties, curry goat and rice and peas and throw in some Chinese with sticky rice, hot gao, cha siu bao. But it's not just the flavor of food I savor, but the island sounds and soul I grew up hearing, wearing my dad's rasa belts and hats, listening and dancing to beats and scats like Peter Tosh, Barrington Levy, Jimmy Cliff, and Bob Marley. One love, one heart, let's get together and feel all right. And we'd get together and feel all right, celebrating Chinese New Year without a care, receiving red envelopes, enveloping money, a sign of good luck to come, but sometimes I feel my luck has run out as I doubt who I really am. I'm Chinese. I'm Jamaican. I'm Chinese Jamaican. I'm Jamaican. I'm Jamaican. I'm Canadian. I am confused like Confucius collecting and contemplating my thoughts. So I look Chinese, except I'm darker and have fuller lips, but I don't fit in or understand them. Am I a Fasian? A fake Asian wanting to be in with those who speak Mandarin and Cantonese, but I don't speak any of these. Not getting any of the cultural jokes because my culture is more Jamaican where my parents grew up in Little London and Kingston, and yes, they have Jamaican accents. No way. Way, you don't say. Look, I basically, I just said that my dad's basically a Chinaman who sounds black. It's really not that whack. And when I tell people my parents are Jamaican, they think that's so cool. But it's hard if you're not sure if you can identify with these roots. Asking who Norman Manley and Marcus Garvey are, who are far from those I grew up hearing, like Sir John A. Macdonald. I knew I was missing something in those history classes. So I'm not black enough for the Jamaicans or yellow enough for the Asians. So where do I fit in? This Miss Chin wondering if she's more Canadian than Chinese and Jamaican. And what does being Canadian even mean? Does it mean hockey? I play that. Peacekeeping? I like peace. Oh, how Asian of me. And I can get up here, uh, <laughs> and I can stand up here getting nowhere debating what is Canadian. D'accord, c'est dommage. Don't. So Homer Simpson of me, please excuse me. I'm just trying to figure out my identity. Identifying with Jamaican people so people think I'm amazing or with Chinese people so I can make fun of Asians, but really mocking myself because now I'm the token Asian in a lot of groups even though I'm clearly not the best representative of that crew. But maybe I'm not just mocking my, my cultures but myself, selfishly caring what you think of me as I keep talking and telling myself everyone loves a Jamaican girl. I have to remind myself. Sometimes I get upset with my mom. So, like, for example, sometimes when, like, we're around a table, like at the New Year's banquet, for example, mom was introducing Jeff. Jeff and I were both there. Um, and and he's met all of my family, so they all know. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not like that is something that's hidden. But she kept introducing him as my friend uh, everywhere. And, like, it was just, like, a weird thing 
where I don't know whether she realized she was doing that actively. Um, and then also, like, whether she's doing that because she feels the need to protect me less herself or, or, or to hide that. More of like a, oh, well, I just, you know what? It just, it doesn't matter what they think, so let me just say this so that they just move on and don't dwell on it. But I also, but I also want her to, like, be like, yeah, this is, this is my son, Brian, and his, his boyfriend, Jeff, right? And then that should also just be something that people move on from. But I recognize that, like, coming from a Jamaican background is 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 different it's there was there was uh there's a religious zeal but then also a, a conservatism that comes from that experience and some of it is founded as well too i remember my mom once told me the story of of an uncle who lived in mandeville and when she was little he everybody knew he was gay and he wasn't an actual uncle. He wasn't related to family, but they they called him uncle because he was an older, older Chinese fella who lived in in the community. And he was gay, and people knew. And, um, and he he was taken out into into the wilderness, and he was killed. And and because he was gay. And but back then, like this was probably in the early 60s nobody you didn't talk about that like hate crimes weren't a thing like people people didn't people didn't didn't care that somebody was gay and being killed right like so i think of that because i think mom thinks of that sometimes when she is when she's thinking of me being an out proud gay man that she's worried that something something really dire or extreme like that would happen and and in some cases she's right there are a lot of crazy people inside the community and outside the community who would be, who could do things like that. Um, and that comes from like her unique experience of experiencing something like that at a young age and then having a son who is like that. But I think I recognize that and I don't expect, I don't expect her to be like, I'm saying I don't expect her to carry a flag and walk around, but she has done that. So, <laughs> like, she's mom comes to the pride parade with me like every year. So, like, it's it's she's there, she's present. Um, I don't think she understands some of the intricacies of that, of 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 the complexities of trying to be who I am in the world that we have. But it's not. I have issues with that too. Like, there's no straight path to those things. So, I think it's easy sometimes to demonize people's experiences. But in our parents' generation, especially being Jamaican and knowing that so much of so much of your identity is wrapped in a, wrapped up in what people think about you or how you present, that they are that they're terrified um, physically and emotionally for their children. I attended Ryerson. Mm -hmm. um, and what was your major? It was uh, information technology management. Uh, and from there, I had uh, gone ill. Mm -hmm. uh, went through um, an illness um, called anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Um, so I was actually uh, f not able to attend school for a bit uh, and work. Uh, well, it's... Uh, basically an autoimmune disease um, that uh, attacks the brain. So at the time I had, I was not myself. I had uh, personality changes. Um, and earlier on, I actually, I, I don't remember all the symptoms of my family. Um, they're the ones that uh, filled me in on what was going on. So I, I wasn't myself, headaches, um, hallucinations, uh, I ran away from the hospital a few times, you know. Um, so these symptoms, uh, they come in various... Um, it, it, someone who has it can present differently. Um, some symptoms are the same. Um, but for myself, because uh, I was the first reported case in Canada, nobody really uh, knew what was wrong. Uh, so I, I was really sick, Um when I was in a, a coma, I had to learn how to walk again. Um, but I was lucky. I was lucky that I had the right doctors there at the right time um, to get me through it. Uh, but there's a lot more awareness now, um, now that there, the, the disease was discovered, mm -hmm. uh, just in 2007. So that's great. 
Um, but from that experience, um, it's it's interesting how uh, I've noticed that I, I'm a, a lot more uh, vocal, a lot more social um, than I used to be, and um, I embrace people after having gone through uh, an illness, embrace life a little bit more and the people around me. Uh, so even today, uh, I like to bring people together, um, hosting events, just um, but keeping those connections, family and friends, um, because those are the people that, um, you know, when you're at your worst, they were there. Not that I doubted it, I knew they would be there, but it's, it's touching to see that those relationships, you know, are strong and they really mean a lot to me. Sometime in the late 90s was when she started to um, exhibit signs of, of what, I, what I think is Alzheimer's. Um, and so, you know, that was, like, that was quite a, a while ago, right? So, I mean, she would have been living with that for um, 20 years. And so I was quite young when that happened. Like, I would have, you know, I was in my 20s when it started, when sort of the first signs started to kind of appear. Um, and and so when I asked you to take the picture, part of it was I didn't really have anything, you know, when, when somebody's well, like, and you're young, like, you're not thinking, like, I need to capture, like, the essence of them, right? And so you don't, like, yes, there are pictures of her, yes, there are things, but I felt like we hadn't really... You know, and then she's uh, in a in a bit of a different place, right? So, like, I was thinking, I, I don't know how to, like, I couldn't ask her about things. Like, there's things I couldn't do anymore, right? And it, it just like, at the time that it was kind of, it was 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 happening. Like, I didn't really think like, like, what's going to change, and should I be doing something now to kind of like, this is going to sound odd but like preserve her memory right like and so so the part of the reason was like I, I just I felt like there was so much I could I could kind of talk about and so the intention was not just to take a picture like I actually wanted to like you know we'll have this this photo of her hands but I, I wanted to be able to talk about like why that was important because you know she just I felt like she did so much with her hands um you know just it, it was there's such symbols of like yeah they're just they're her body parts but there are such symbols of her like love and caring you know and I thought how many babies has she like burped and changed and rocked to sleep and like comforted you know because it's like all of her children her grandchildren she had great grandchildren that she was able to hold and and you know um so all of these babies um all of the sewing that she did she made uh, wedding dresses. She made christening gowns and wedding dresses and first com my first communion dress and my cousin's first communion dress and bridesmaids dresses for my cousin's weddings. And, you know, these are all like my cousin's wedding dresses. And there was just so many of these like, you know, really important events that she was such a part of, like she was there physically, but also that she like, you know, made these dresses and these clothes with so much love for her family um, and, and then like cooking, right? So she was like this phenomenal cook, but she would, everything she did was like with such care, whether it was like, you know, preparing a vegetable or like, you know, deboning chicken, whatever it happened to be. Um, it was just like very carefully and thoughtfully done. Um, yeah. And she was just like, even into her, um, into her illness when she was at the home, like she would constantly be moving her hands, right? Because she would even just be sewing, like, you know, after dinner, she would sit there and she would have a garment that she was like hand, either hand stitching, hand hemming, or picking out a hem or doing something, but she was never, her hands were never really like idle. So I just felt like that was a kind of a small thing, but it was like, said so much about her.
What I would really like to do is to have a research center that really focuses on the Chinese and the Caribbean in all their complexities, because I think sometimes that we, um, because you have to, right, because you're telling a story, so you're making a narrative, we sort of homogenize that experience, so we haven't even really touched, you know, at anything, really, I think, in that experience. We haven't talked about, um, like I said, class, like, you know, we always talk about the Chinese shopkeeper, but there wasn't just shopkeepers, there were merchants, and there were other people there as well. Um, we haven't talked about um, how they navigated all these outside children. So many of them had how, how many outside children. When were they allowed in? Or when were they just on the sides? And how did they how did they manage all of those experiences? How did they manage under Michael Manley? Like I, I really want to um, explore that because I think that changes some of the the narratives of Jamaica at that time period. Um, so and then you know there was not just one Chinese. It's like the the you know different ethnic groups of Chinese, right? How is experience different in Trinidad from Jamaica? Like, there's just so much that we haven't done. But I would also like to memorialize the Chinese shop. You know, I, you know, I just think that that um, experience opens up so much, so many dialogues, and so many ways that people can communicate. So, I think that just as long as we sort of get the sense. And I hope that other Chinese Jamaicans will get the sense that the importance role, the important role that they can play in understanding how communities migrate, how they survive, not just the Chinese. Um, you know, I just I think they have so much information to share because they are an inherently migrant community. Like they move and then they move and then they move and then they move. So there's so much knowledge there on how to survive and how to thrive. And uh, yeah, so I just think that that is just so important that I hope we don't lose that. Because I also think that, you know, with each generation, there's, you know, we get more Canadian, whatever that means, right? So we tend to lose some of those stories. So I would hope that, uh, you know, that this project and others will help us retain some of that.